Hi everyone, I'm Yanni Kiriaka. I'm the head of strength and conditioning at Hong Kong Lacrosse. I'm really excited to contribute to the first Hong Kong virtual LaxCon. Today we're going to be looking at how to shoot harder. So we're going to be looking at the physical qualities needed to shoot as hard as possible. Everyone wants to be able to shoot and break the net. So we thought we'd give the people what they want. And we'll try and give you some guys some information on how to improve your shot speed, as well as giving you guys a link with a 12 week program that can help to in increase your shot speed as well. So let's try and keep it short. Let's get into it. So what does fast shooting look like? We've got a couple of great athletes shooting here for you. So first we got Wesley Wong, just from a, uh, just like a one step situation, shooting as hard as he possibly can. And we'll see an example of a few shots from Wesley, a male athlete and a few shots from Gahe, a female athlete. And what we'll find is that they both have attractors. So basically there's gonna be three or four key landmarks that they both hit, okay? And if you go anywhere in the world, and you look at any sport that involves powerful rotation, we'll see these same attractors, basically these same key positions. So now we see a little bit bigger space with a bit of a run in still with the intent to shoot as hard as possible. So the only instruction they've been given here is to shoot as hard as they can. And then we've just set them up either with like one step or with the ability to run in. So it doesn't really matter if it's a men's stick or a women's stick, the key positions remain the same. The release point might be a tiny bit different, but the key positions remain the same. So here we've got some landmarks, okay? Okay, so here we are. So we've got some key landmarks I'm gonna highlight. So I've broken shooting down into four key landmarks. You might have seen different positions before. You might classify it in a different way and that's completely fine. I wanna keep it as simple as possible and just break down the few key positions that everyone will hit if you're trying to rotate as hard as possible. So it'll be the same thing if you're a baseball pitcher, if you're a lacrosse player, if you're a tennis player, if you're a child who's throwing a ball as hard as they can from their hand, doesn't make a difference. These key positions should be roughly the same. Now, due to the fact that I don't have an indoor facility with a great, um, like a great slow-mo camera, We've just gonna use the one step shot here. So some of the positions might not look as exaggerated as they would be if I use the video of Wesley shooting at um, on the run um, or at high speed, but that's just the situation we're in. So we'll still highlight these key positions. So the first position I'm gonna highlight is the rear foot touchdown here. So basically he establishes a base and this is gonna allow him to put force into the ground through that rear foot, which is really important. The next position we're going to look at is the four foot touchdown. So now that allows us to have a powerful rotation by giving us the ability to maintain our body position and posture. If we don't plant that front foot, we're just going to fall over when we try and rotate. We want that step to be pretty big. The next thing is we start to rotate and the back foot leaves the floor. The body now, instead of facing, uh, facing us, is now facing the goal. The ball's not out of the stick yet, as you'll see. And then we have the finish where he finishes in that kind of pocket or kind of like putting the seatbelt on some coaches might say. So there are four key positions and they're not as exaggerated as they might be if we had a better camera, but essentially they're the four key positions I wanna highlight that you'll see when someone's uh, aggressively shooting or aggressively rotating hard, no matter what sport you're looking at. Okay, so what physical requirements are there to shoot in hard? I've broken it down into these four physical requirements and something additionally that you need to do. So lower body strength and power is really, really important. You need to be able to produce the force to actually be able to shoot hard. Uh, T-spine mobility, I think is important to a degree. Um, sometimes we find that if athletes don't come from a rotational sport background and they come to lacrosse a little bit late, they might be a little bit limited in their rotation. It's not the absolute most important thing, but if we don't have good rotation for our T-spine, what we'll find is that we might not have the ability to shoot as hard as we possibly could. Uh, we need the ability to ro the rotate powerfully using our trunk. So basically that's something that's integrated and we're putting it all together. 
and we need to practice shooting hard as often as possible, as maximally as possible. If we don't practice shooting hard, then you're not gonna be able to shoot very hard. All right, so lower body strength. Why do we need lower body strength? Really, really simple for a lot of sporting actions, but especially shooting hard, putting force into the ground really is the most important thing. If when that rear foot touchdown happens, if we're not able to put a large amount of force into the ground, then I'm not sure how we're gonna produce enough force or how we're gonna compensate through other ways to be able to shoot hard. So here's just a simple example of lower body strength. Um, any squat variation is gonna be good for increasing lower body strength. We find that goblet squats, which you're seeing here, is a great exercise to start off with, especially if someone doesn't have a huge amount of experience and hasn't been in the gym a lot. So a goblet squat really is a great place to start. Then there's some other variations. We're gonna look at a back squat and a front squat. Everyone in here has probably seen these things um, or seen these exercises before, but getting strong in these movements is really important in general, but specifically for shooting hard, it's gonna help a lot. Um, so how strong is strong enough? It's a good question and there's not really a solid answer for it, but I think for a male athlete, a senior male athlete, being able to back squat between 1.75 and two times their body weight is gonna be very good. That's what we're gonna look for. For a female athlete, being able to squat around 1.25 to 1.5 times their body weight is gonna be really good. And that's in a back squat. Now, if we're looking at other movements, it's gonna be a little bit different, but I'll just highlight those two. So if we are not strong in the lower body, we're gonna to have to be extremely powerful without being strong, which can happen, but is unlikely. And we do wanna have both of those things to give us the ability to shoot maximally. So if we're looking at lower body power, producing force and a large amount of force is all well and good. We obviously need to, I've just highlighted that, um, but we need to produce that force quickly because anything we do on the field has a time constraint. When we shoot, obviously that rear foot doesn't stay on the ground forever. In a real life situation, there's gonna be defenders, there's gonna be other things going on that you need to think about, but essentially you need to produce a lot of force and you need to produce a lot of that force quite quickly. So that's the same for many other sporting movements, obviously. Power really is what we're chasing as an SNC coach a lot of the time. This is a great plyometric exercise for power, but you don't have to use something like this. You can use any type of loaded jump. You could use any types of Olympic lifts, but ideally you wanna train across the whole spectrum. This is a really good example. Wes is obviously quite a good athlete as he's been in our program for a while and we produce great athletes. Um, and that's why he looks so powerful there. So lower body power is really important, but the next slide is gonna highlight why both of those things, strength and power is so important. So. Here, what we're looking at comes from driveline baseball in the US and Anthony, I'm not gonna try and say his last name because I think I'm gonna be ruining it, has kindly given us this graphic and the graphic on the next slide. His Twitter handle is just in the bottom right of this graphic. So please give him a follow, um, let him know if you think his work's good. We really appreciate being able to use his work. So this graph is really simple. They've used an isometric mid thigh pull which basically is a fixed barbell at around mid thigh. And usually people wear straps and they try and aggressively stand up as fast as possible and they push as hard as possible. So if you haven't seen this before, think about the very last period of a deadlift where the lift is trying to finish, but the bar is actually in a fixed position. Squat jump, um, I believe the squat jump would have been a jump where the athlete pauses in the bottom position, but I'm not exactly sure, so, okay? And there's around 100 athletes that have been tested in both of these tests, and that's anywhere from the high school level to the pro level, so all the way up to Major League Baseball. Actually, there may, might be 200 athletes, don't quote me on that. But what we find is that they can divide people based on their scores and based on their throwing speed. So this top right quadrant is when they're good at both tests, okay? So they're able to produce a large amount of force and they're able to produce that force very quickly. And what we find with these dots here is that a lot of them are pitchers that can throw 88 miles per hour plus. So they're gonna be quite successful and get paid a lot of money to play their sport. 
over here, we find that there are some pitchers that are throwing above 88 miles per hour. They're not that strong. They haven't done that well in the isometric mid thigh pull, but they have done well in the squat jump. So by being powerful and being, not being incredibly strong, they can still throw very high speeds and be successful. As we come to the left side of, the, of this, what we find is that low force and low power, obviously they cannot throw very hard. And if you look at the top left, where we're looking at high force, so really, really strong, but not as powerful. Some of them are able to get away with throwing 80 to 87 and 88 miles per hour plus, but nowhere near as many as in the top right and in the bottom right. So the top right really is what we're looking for as SNC coaches. We're trying to provide athletes the ability to be very strong and very powerful. Now, that's the ideal situation. Um, and I think if we were to, to test this, in other populations. So if we were to look at lacrosse players, we would find the same thing. If we were to look at tennis players, I believe we'd find the same thing. So this one, what we're looking at is we're looking at baseball hitters. So it's exactly the same concept that applies. We have guys that have better bat speed in the top right, okay, in the high force, high power. These guys can throw above 75 miles per hour. So it's not just one quality. And we're not taking away the technical component at all, but we find that people are going to be more successful when they have good lower body strength and good lower body power. So if anyone thinks they just need to go out and shoot as hard as they can, it's obviously a component of it. But if you don't have the physical qualities to do that, you're not going to be very successful. So strength and power are really, really important. Now, I mentioned mobility. Obviously, we're talking about rotation and I think this just sums it up. You need to give yourself the opportunity to be successful. So let's say that you did have really good lower body strength and did have good lower body power, but you couldn't rotate due to any restrictions. You're not gonna be able to shoot very hard. So really simply, we can in, in, include rotational components to our training program and our mobility program we think on a continuum of passive drills to active. And we're just going to see a few examples from Wes here. And he's going to show a simple drill to start off with. So this is the start of World's Greatest Stretch, where he's going to get rotation on both sides. As a rotational athlete, there's no reason why you shouldn't be incorporating this within your warm-ups. So we're just going to see him rotate on both sides. This might not help improve his rotational capacity, but it's just going to be able to maintain that and make sure he doesn't become stiff due to any training or lifestyle things that are going on. So he's going to do both sides and this just makes sure that he's able to rotate fully on both sides. The next drill is going to be more of what we think of as a passive drill. We'll just wait for him to finish and then we'll see it. But yeah, we'll see a passive mobility drill where his lower body is locked in. And this just means that he can't find rotation through his lumbar spine with the knees in this position. And he's just going to reach around and then come back, trying to keep his hand in contact with the floor throughout the whole movement. There are other variations of this where the top knee can be on a foam roller. There's no reason you have to go all the way around. This is just one that I know Wesley likes. This can be a really good starting point if you've never tested your ability to rotate. And then you can move on to this, which is more of an active movement, okay? So we're actually finding some strength here as well. And what you'll find is you might have deficiencies on a certain side, and those are the areas maybe you can spend a little bit more time on. So there's a few different variations. There's no reason why you can't include uh, rotational movements into your warm-ups or into your kind of uh, rehab type work as well. But these are three simple things that you can easily put into your program on different days. They're probably gonna help quite help make quite a big difference. And they're very low cost in terms of time and equipment. So there's no reason why you guys shouldn't be doing this to make sure you have the ability to be successful. Okay, so how do you tie all these things together? All right, we haven't actually spoke about rotating powerfully yet, but this is a way that we can bring all of the qualities that we've spoken about, including muscular coordination together. So. We love med ball work and there are specific rules we have when it comes to med ball work. The most horrible thing that we see is when med ball work is submaximal, okay? And that's not okay. So the beautiful thing about a med ball is that you can continually uh, 
accelerate throughout the entire movement until the ball is released, which is why it's a specific movement to sport and why we love it. So if we do med ball work, it has to be maximal. We should be trying to break the wall we're throwing the med ball at or the person potentially. If you've got a friend who's helping you, we should be trying to break the med ball. Okay. And there are lots of different variations that we can use, but we think about moving from general to specific like always. So here we're going to see a few variations. This is one we like to start at because there's not that much that can go wrong. It's not that much of a rotational movement as the lower body's fixed and we can't really use uh, the lower body as we normally would. But I find that this is my favorite thing to start with just because it gets our athletes used to rotating. And there's not that much that in terms of safety that can go wrong and anyone can learn to do it pretty quickly. So that's a very general movement. And this is more of a specific one. So we'll see a three, a three step shot med ball throw. So he's gonna aggressively step towards the wall and he's gonna push the ball as hard as he can. Now he would be even more aggressive, but this gym we filmed in was quite narrow. So he would actually probably finish even closer to the wall or his weight would be moving forwards. So really simple, try and throw the ball as hard as you can, make sure every rep looks the same. And it's just important that the max intent is there. So we tie all of the things we've discussed together with rotational power movements using med balls. Okay, so how do you put that into a program? Like I said, we're gonna put a program out. Um, hopefully it's gonna be a link underneath this video. Um, but this is an example program structure, which I think is quite versatile and can help to improve your lower body power, um, your upper body strength, and also your ability to rotate effectively. So we don't want the programs to be too long. We start with a power complex at the beginning and we have a lower body plyometric exercise. So they could be like pogos that you've seen. We have a med ball rotation exercise and we have a mobility exercise for your T-spine. Then we move into the strength segment where we'll have a main lower body strength exercise, a lower body power exercise, which biomechanically is similar to the lower body strength exercise in the hope that we get a potentiation effect. So the lower body strength exercise should make the power exercise better. And then in the rest period, we'll do a low level injury prevention exercise to make sure that you're an athlete that's quite resilient and isn't just one that's able to rotate hard, but don't do anything else. We want good strength in the upper body as a lacrosse player obviously needs good strength, but it's actually really important to be able to maintain positions while you're shooting and some level of strength is important to do that. So usually we use push and pull exercises and then you might have another injury prevention exercise after that. So it's a really simple structure. And this is just an example of some of the movements that you could do. Um, some of our players watching this will know some of these exercises and they'll realize that this is the way we program quite a lot. We use three exercises together fairly frequently. Um, and then we move into some other type of work depending on what we're doing. But this is a good example of a well-rounded program that's gonna help you shoot harder, but also be a resilient athlete that's strong and able to deal with the varied demands of lacrosse. But what about accuracy? So I know lots of coaches might be watching this thinking, okay, well, shooting hard is lovely, but what happens if you're gonna get checked by a defender because you're taking so long? What about the context, context and the situation? Um, obviously I haven't spoken about accuracy, but conceptually, this is something I wanted to raise. So if we're comparing athlete A and athlete B, and we're looking at their maximum shot speeds, athlete A has a maximum shot speed of 80 miles per hour, and athlete B has a maximum shot speed of 100 miles an hour. When they need to shoot with more control, when they're in different situations and the context doesn't allow them to have the perfect situation to step in and shoot, um, what we'll find is that at 80% of their shot speed, we'll find that they probably have roughly the same amount of control, but athletes B shot at 80% will obviously be much faster and much harder than athlete A's 80%, okay? So if we have the max, maximal capacity to do something, we're probably gonna be in control at sub-maximal uh, sub levels of performance. This would be the same in terms of sprint speed, if we have an athlete who can run 10 meters per second, they can probably do more repeated efforts at 80% of that, okay? 
if we have an athlete that can bench press 100 kg, they can probably do more reps at 80 kg than another athlete can do if their maximum bench press is 90 kg. So we want to give our athletes the maximal capacity to do something and at a sub-maximal uh, needs, when they need to perform sub-maximally, they're going to be able to do this with greater control. Under fatigue, they're still going to be able to shoot harder than an athlete that doesn't have a shot that's at, as high. So obviously, I'm not saying that just having a huge shot speed is important, but it's going to give you the ability to perform better under fatigue and in controlled situations than an athlete who can't shoot quite as hard. Okay, so I just want to highlight uh, Tony Holler, who's a sprint coach. He has a system called Feed the Cats. And I think it's really, really applicable to almost anything that you can measure. But essentially, they often do maximal sprints and they record, rank and publish. So they always time their athletes because if their concept is, if you're not timing an athlete, how do you know if they're truly sprinting? So I believe the same for shooting as well. If you have the ability to record an athlete's shot speed using a radar gun, that you should definitely do it. Okay, so that's the first thing. By recording something, you make it more meaningful and you should record rank and publish, which means that you're recording the speeds, obviously, but you're making sure athletes know where they sit in terms of the rest of the athletes you have and you should publish it so they all have it. And that's gonna drive competition against the athlete themselves. So they want to improve from the last time to the next time. And also it's going to improve uh, competition between the athletes you're working with. Um, so it's a really important concept that can be picked up from the speed world and transferred over to lacrosse. Um, and also just the last thing is that external measures can be really useful. So often you don't need to give really um, detailed coaching cues to an athlete. If they have a radar gun and they shoot 80 miles an hour, they can think about what they've done subconsciously and they can try and shoot harder. So it's great for motivation, but I think generally we're problem solvers as well and people will find a way to shoot harder each time. So giving an athlete the ability to know how well they've done is really important and is probably gonna help improve their performance over time. Okay, so just to round up the things we've discussed today, you need to get strong, get powerful, aggressively rotate, have the requisite mobility, the prerequisite mobility needed to shoot as hard as possible, and you need to practice shooting hard. So if you just get strong and powerful, but you never go out and shoot, potentially you're not gonna be able to tie those things together. So if you do these five things on a regular basis and you train for these five things, you're gonna be successful and you're gonna be able to shoot harder than you did previously. If you are not consistent with doing all of these things, then you're probably not gonna make long-term improvements and you might be wasting your time. So it's all well and good having this information and motivation in the short term, but you must be consistent if you wanna see a difference. So thanks for listening to this presentation. Um, like I said, I'm Yanni Kiriaku. You can get hold of me via my email or on LinkedIn. If you've got any questions at all, please let me know. I'd be happy to get back to you. And just one plug for our SNC internship. Um, we try and run the best SNC internship in Hong Kong. We try and produce coaches that are employable and can either work for us or go out into the big wide world and work for other teams or associations. So that's going to be starting in September. We'll be recruiting within the next few months. So if you see any adverts out there and you want to be a, a part of our team, and you want to help us produce better athletes that are able to go out and be successful and perform in the lacrosse field, please get in touch with us. Any questions, let me know. If not, look out for the official job advert and you'll see the internship will be starting in September. So thanks for listening, guys. I hope you really can apply this information. We're going to put a program out as well that you can download and use for 12 weeks. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. I hope you had fun listening. And like I said, let me know if you've got any questions.